This lab is packed with one mad science experiment after another, featuring external clock generators to circumvent overclocking limitations. The power measurement device that inspired our Intel versus AMD efficiency testing, custom fan controllers, custom made liquid nitrogen pots, EVC2 hacking tools to also bypass overclocking limitations, and dozens of other custom hardware solutions. And all of these are built by a small team that powers the industry probably a lot more than you realize. Whether or not you know it, there's one man whose work has consistently appeared in several of the major lab tours we've done over the years. He appeared in our AMD lab tour documentary previously and in our Kinpin lab tours. This is Elmore, and we got to visit his lab where he's fighting to keep overclocking alive. Between those mad science experiments and overclocking endeavors, Elmore has recently been branching out into more consumer products in addition to the enthusiast of lab tier equipment. He builds and programs custom PCBs that do all kinds of things. In the past, he built a DDR test platform for AMD that we showed in our lab documentary. In this special edition to our factory tour series, we'll walk through Elmore's lab and get an educational look at the cool hardware hacks he's been building. This is definitely someone you should be paying more attention to in the industry if you're not already. In this video, we really just wanted to spotlight someone doing cool stuff with computers and with the technology around them. So let's take a look at Elmore's lab. Before that, this video is brought to you by Montech and the K95 Pro case. The K95 Pro is a dual chamber enclosure with configurable options for storage and power supplies. The K95 has a deep 35 millimeter cable channel for management, support for dual power supplies if you want it, which could be useful for a thread ripper system, and ample radiator and fan mounting options scattered around the top, back, bottom, side, and front of the case. The front also can be mesh or solid, with the mesh running a higher porosity for more breathability. Learn more at the link in the description below. I would say a lot of the things we're doing is actually because, to some degree, uh, it's getting a bit more difficult to do overclocking. Mm. Uh, things yeah. are more and more integrated, yeah. so it's easier and easier to lo lock things down, right? Um, so one thing that we used to make uh, is this uh, debug card. Mm. So it uses a TPM header okay. uh, to get the uh, port 80 debug data from something that is called the LPC bus, which okay. is a, it's a legacy from ISA, I think. Uh, that was around on PCI. Say, yeah. So that's why you used to have these PCI debug cards. Mm -hmm. They would plug in and get the, the postcodes out, right? Um, and then on somewhat more recent boards, without that, you still had TPM headers, which exposed that same bus. Okay. So that's how we used to be able to get the postcode data. So um, you end up discontinuing it, I guess. Yeah, so basically there was a platform change. Um, to ESBI from TPM. So TPM okay. used to be used on the motherboard for mm. communicating between the CPU, the Super I.O. Mm. and uh, EC, and also the TPM module. Uh, and that was changed to something called ESBI on the more recent generations. If you plug in just any seven segment device like this to a board, is it gonna have, it can read codes of some kind or it's like so if you have the in the past if you had the tpm mm -hmm. uh bus exposed you could okay theoretically today if you have the esbi bus exposed you could mm. but there's unfortunately no natural um reason for the board vendors to have a header for it okay uh there is like an sbi tpm header mm. however it's a separate bus from there's two sbi buses now for one that goes to the Super I.O. and to the EC that has the debug data. Okay. And the second one that's used for talking to um, the TPM device. Uh, so there's no, no natural way yeah. to get this uh, information anymore. A lot of tools and equipment here. I, the one that was most interesting to me were these. Right. <clears throat> Do you want to walk through? Sure. Uh, well, this is basically a Chinese cheap version of this. Well, uh -huh. this is also Chinese, but it's a bit more expensive. Right. So this is uh, like an electronic load. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a much simpler version of it. And you can see they actually retrofitted like an AMD CPU cooler. Yeah. It, which is a very smart way of uh, using a commodity product to get high performance cooling on your on your uh, design. Right? And what's what's under the uh, <laughs> cooler? Is it fats? Or? Yeah, so okay. there's two MOSFETs under here, okay. which are they're controlling basically as resistors, as uh, heat load generators. <laughs> right. And they sit on like a small PCB as well. So 
almost like a CPU. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even has the CPU temperature diode on there. What is the, is this a screen? Yeah, what so is it's that? just an LCD What screen. does that normally output? Uh, so this will uh, show you the voltage, the current, okay. uh, your set point. You can do, do like constant current, constant resistance, mm. constant power. Uh, and it, it has a microcontroller on here, which will regulate that. Right? That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I like it. Did this just get retired when you moved to stuff like this? Uh, not always. Okay. So like sometimes you want to try something quickly, quickly on your desk. Yeah. Uh, this one actually, I think it, I think I broke it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Fed, fed like uh, the voltage in the wrong polarity or something oh, like that, and yeah. it wasn't very happy after that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so like stuff like that, for example, is usually like the more expensive stuff. They won't break if you do that. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Has protections. Um, yeah, I mean, we still use it, and th this can do like 40 amps. Mm. So let's say we need 50 or 60, you can just hook up an additional one of these, right. for example, right? And just, uh, supplement. There, there's still uses for it. I would How say. about this? So that that's just the same, uh, different variant of the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's used as an Intel CPU cooler. Yes. So this should actually work. So if you want to see what's on, what the display looks sure. like. Sure. Yeah. So you just adjust the current here, for example. It reads current, calculates power. Uh, you can do like battery discharge uh -huh. measurements, like what's the number of watt hours that it's been it's been pulling. Well, that's over cool time. too. Yeah. Okay, I'm actually kind of impressed with right the functionality. This is like ten bucks, by the way. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but this is something that you've made. Yep. And I think you sell still. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's actually been pretty popular, especially for LN2 use. Yeah. So it can, it's able to read the really low temperatures. It has pretty fast update rate. Mm. And it's like 50 bucks instead of uh, like a 300, whatever fluke. Can we talk about the external clock control stuff? Yes, right. So this is, uh, I don't know, uh, more this of an experiment, ready. I would say, at this point, rather than an actual product. Uh -huh. We have a system here which uh, we're basically feeding with fully external clocks. The motherboard here has an external clock generator on the board. So we're feeding a 100 megahertz uh, external reference clock into the motherboard. So that lets us uh, just dynamically control the okay. base clock. For the motherboard one, is that this? Yes. Okay. So that's Can a you... differential PCIe clock signal. Okay. There's the wires to the GPU. Yep. There's this to the board mm -hmm. for the external clock or the board, yep. I guess. And then there's a separate external clock that goes to the graphics card. And then what are these smaller wires going to? Uh, right, so the, the orange wires the, the, with the switch, mm -hmm. that's to, oh, uh, that that's to enable the external clock. Okay, so, so if you want to toggle it off and go back to internal, is that what that's for? Or is it? It's a little bit more complicated okay. than that, but <laughs> basically setting it over uh, just in the BIOS, mm. we'll you try to use the external clock gen on the motherboard. Mm. And then we need to change a switch on the board to use the, our own external okay, clock. Okay, I see. Yeah. So that generates the clock signal and has a microcontroller for like a simple UI with a display and buttons. So, and then you've got a screen on the board yeah. and you have three switches on it. Mm -hmm. And then is the GPU, uh, GPU to the same board, so I guess. So GPU is clock two there. Uh, okay. The motherboard is clock one. Got it. So what happens when we adjust the reference clock on the graphics card is that you shift everything, mm -hmm. right? So like you shift your uh, GPU, you shift your memory clock, you shift uh, whatever internal mm -hmm. timers and, and all of this. Should we show this in action? Yes, let's the do it. So because we can't measure or we can't read the, the clock frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to measure by performance. Right. So we have to benchmark it. Uh, we do have the, this is the signal now to the GPU. Mm -hmm. It's on the oscilloscope. So just to check the oh, does the signal look good? Is it the right amplitude? Make sure it's uh, the input is actually doing something. I guess. Yeah. yeah. And this, I mean, the setup's cool. Like, so you've got EVC two hooked up. You have your external clock, and then on top of the power supply is this for reading the power. Yeah. So that's a, a product we make that's uh, called a PMD. Mm. So it just lets you measure the the input power to the graphics card and to the CPU. Power measurement device. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go to clock one, which is the motherboard one. And let's set that to 101. And we get the change here. All right. Here you read the bus speed, right? Yeah. So let's go to 102. I think that should be stable. I haven't really tested this actually. But yeah, it looks good. Even if it's not stable, it's still pretty much working, right? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> it suddenly shuts down. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to go back to 100. All right. 
Yeah, that is cool. <clears throat> very, very simple. Yeah. And then on the GPU side, so, any demo you can Yeah. Give? So basically you have to run the baseline test, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of liked running Fairmark. Okay. Uh, also, we have to first disable the power limit of the... So the way the power limit works on AMD cards is that it's reported uh, through SVI 3, I mm -hmm. believe. Uh, so it's tele telemetry provided by the um, VRM controller mm. that's reporting the, the power consumption, right? So it's like an output power reading. Right. Well, on M NVIDIA cards, you have shunt resistors that yeah. measure the input power, right? And it's a fully external one. Right. Uh, but the good thing about the VRM controller reporting it is that we can kind of uh, adjust it. Trick it. So if yeah. you know what to, what to set where, uh, you can make it report a lower output current and power. Okay. So that effectively effectively gives you an underreporting, so so you have more get, headroom to pull get, more. Gets rid of the power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we run fair mark, uh, we'll see some uh, more consistent numbers. And then you've got as far as the actual physical EVC. So this is the EVC two, right? And <coughs> then you've got it wired up to the back of the card here. Mm. Did you have to solder on the three pin on the back of the card? Yeah. How do you normally figure out where to solder it? So on AMD cards, uh, they all have the same debug header. Okay. Basically on all of them. Uh, Is it, it just normally unpopulated yeah, pads? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, then it kind of varies. Mm. Uh, Asus card usually has very good unpopulated pads. You mm. can use like just through hole pin headers. Yeah, I saw that on the Asus motherboard. Yeah. Then the the rest is uh, yeah, it's a bit of mixed. Like the worst, I think, are the founder edition. Uh, well, that's not surprising. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this side is that connected to the power supply? Yeah. So that's an EPS eight pin. Okay. So this um, is your power in. Yeah. So you have two EPS eight pin channels on the okay. right. Tilt this a little bit, <coughs> and then you have three uh, PCIe connectors, two channels actually. So two of them are on the same channel. Okay. So did you say it was input or output power, or is it uh, input power? Yes. So it's measuring the the power going through the wires. Okay. Yeah. Got it. For this cable you have here going underneath the GPU to the PCIe riser. Yeah. So that's the uh, 12 volt on the oh, PCIe slot. Here. Okay. Yes. Do you, okay, so it's the 12. So I'm actually using the CPU uh, connector to power that right now. Right. So then you can you can toggle through this button. Oh, I didn't even see that. Okay. And then GPU now is going to be uh, this cool. cable, so the 6 pin. And then CPU here will be your slot power. Okay. So that's how I connect it. And you can so you can specify between total and then the... Uh, yeah, and then you can see details, right? So you can see your voltage in your current. What's the polling um, rate or the report frequency, I guess? So technically, it's actually pretty good, but it's a matter of development. I think right oh. now we're doing about uh, 10 kilohertz at best. Okay, <laughs> okay yeah, uh, that's still pretty good, though. So that's what, every uh, 100 microseconds? Yeah. Did you say you already... Overrode the power limit? Or yeah. Yeah, okay. So I overrode the power limit. I set 100% fan speed yeah, to not have that. the thermal impact. Right. I set the uh, GPU clock fixed 2600 min, mm. 2700 max, which is okay. as fixed as you're going to get, right? Right. So you can see, like, you get close to 2700. Temperature is still fine. We get an average. It's like 194 FPS. So did you get your baseline here? <sighs> yes. So we had 194 now. Uh, so yeah, it's the same. 194? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's what I had before with these settings. So then let's try to do this live. Uh, so we just clock two here, which is the GPU. So we'll go up to, we'll do the same 105. Cool. So I think Very we're going to lose display for a little bit while it resyncs. All right, yeah, works. You can back. see the change here. How high have you taken the clock? 108, I think. Okay. But that was when I. T uh, I was testing this before I made this board, so mm. I actually bought uh, like a 108 megahertz oh, okay. like chip, yeah, like a, a clock generator, okay, or like a, not really a crystal, but like a CMOS clock chip. Uh huh. Um, and you just soldered that on. And just swapped it, swapped it, and checked funny. if it worked. Okay, <laughs> so, that's funny. Uh, that was the easiest way to try it, right? So. So then, if you run again, yeah. What are we? Uh... So let's see if this works or if we have to reboot. Looks. Good, yeah. So the last time it was 202 mm. instead of 194. Like last time I did the results. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, last time we ran this, now it was 194 again. And now it looks like 202 again. So yeah, it's. <laughs> right. So that's plus uh, 
four percent. Yeah. Yeah, not bad. From a five percent reference clock change. Yeah. So Does external clock gen work on do you, anything with Nvidia or? I have not tested it yet, okay. but should. Okay. So <laughs> we need. I need to get a bunch of GPUs and see yeah, what <laughs> what works. Cool. Also on Nvidia, I would say. Uh, it's not as not, not as big of a problem. You mm -hmm. don't have clock limits, yeah, which yeah. is something you have on AMD. Like right. you have arbitrary clock limits, so you can't overwrite. Okay. Well, on Vi Nvidia, they're pretty generous with the range on clocks. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. usually a power limit or a voltage limit. Yeah, like VREL or yeah. or just power. Yeah. So clocking is a bit like you can see it's a bit more a bit trickier to mm. get around. <laughs> yeah. What else? Do you have anything else you want to show over on this side? What about like the fan? Right. Controller? Yeah. This is the. So this is our EFCX9. It's a fan controller with nine individually controllable fan headers, mm -hmm. all PWM, the yeah. fan header yeah. version, right? So this is a full-fledged version of okay. that one. Uh, so you want to walk me through it? So yeah, as I said, this is just a nine fan header um, uh, fan controller. Uh -huh. This has hardware support, I mean like hardware based like control, mm. and then it can also be controlled via the software which I'll show you later. This also can get like data from thermistors that you oh, connect cool. to okay. these pins. And there's also a temperature and humidity sensor on board. So you, m you can use that as like, well, you put it in the case and right. then like if the inside the case, the temperature is like, too high, ambient. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you want to like increase the airflow or something. Right. right? So you, that's, this is gonna be useful for that. And the thermistor, can you just run a wire into, like, so if you plug a thermistor in over here, right. is the idea that you just run the wire to somewhere in the case? Right, yeah. Okay. What are the switches, what do you use the switches for? The switches are used for the hardware controls that mm -hmm. I've um, explained. Um, so if you have, like, you can do this, right? Right. And you can change, like, so let's see, fan you got, mode. So I saw temp fixed. So this is, like, a temperature-based control. Right. That's, like, two fixed points. And it'll interpolate between. Okay, cool. And uh, so, what are the uh, oh fixed? I guess yep. so. Just duty percent and ramp. Mm -hmm. So, is the ramp when it says two percent? Is that just been incrementally two percent steps? Uh, yes. Okay. To like, like fifty two percent per second. Yep. yep. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. I see. And then the other one is uh, FEXT, which is fan external, right? Okay. So you can get actually you can connect this uh -huh. to like a motherboard header, and then you can let that control the actually okay. like the fan headers. I would say actually the ramp feature is really useful because it's something that for some reason the motherboard vendors try to do but can't get right. <laughs> yeah. So like as soon as your CPU temperature goes yeah, up you mother, get it immediately 100%. Vendor. <laughs> motherboard um, vendors really struggle with fan controls I feel like in yeah, general. Yeah. And so do OEMs. I mean a lot of the pre-built systems we look, like, look at have just really terrible uh, Fan curves. Right. Well, RGB control is another popular one. <laughs> yeah. What's right. this? So this is actually the UPP. So what does UPP stand for? Uh, USB powered PCIe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just a converter that does USB PD to, um, well, PCIe 6 mm. Right. These are all in development, by the way. This right, is right. Pro prototypes. Right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, the EPD, this is my first PCB. <laughs> okay, cool. This is my baby. Uh -huh. <laughs> what does EPD stand for? Easy uh, PWM to DC. So if you have like cheap fans mm -hmm. that you want to use on something like, I don't know, like a Mora or something, right? You want to, but you want to have like PWM capabilities to control it. You can use this as um, okay. to do more, I guess, more advanced more fan advanced. curves or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so this just uh, is a simple adapter. It's supposed to just go in between the fan and the header or just connect between these. So technically, you can power a graphics card with that as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it handles up to 75 volts. So this is a wire view. Yes. So uh, why um, didn't you call it their wire view? I don't know. <laughs> Ask Roman. So this is the PCB for it. OK, cool. Without the housing. So that is a power meter for your cable while also being a 180 degree uh, right, connector adapter right. uh, for your system. What's the update frequency on this? Do you know? Uh, yes, so you have if you go into the menu, you have the averaging uh, option there. Do I push and hold for that? Yeah, so go to average, and then you press and hold. And then you can cycle through the options. Oh, okay. So, so like this is every two, 200? 200 milliseconds. That's so cool. it's like accumulating values, 29 microseconds, 1 millisecond. Cool. 
uh, 200 milliseconds. And then obviously you can't see the numbers that quickly on the screen. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's check out the next thing. So this is uh, another talent from the community we're mm. working with uh, that made his PCB and we're basically helping manufacture and uh, distribute it. Do you want to name the person? Uh, it's on the PCB, so okay. it goes under the nickname Dan Gilmore. Um, so this is a front panel this is uh, cool. add-in board to add power buttons and reset buttons to yeah, primarily, I would say, older motherboards mm -hmm. or cheaper motherboards. No, this is cool. So we were talking about this before filming, but these separate, so you up with three. And then that's the front panel header for the motherboard. Yeah. which I guess is fairly standardized, except you noted that there is an alternate switch. Right, so there was at some point, I don't know if this is actually standardized, but all the vendors use the same pinout. That's true, it's not standardized, it's um, just the copied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, the pinout is actually listed conveniently on here as well. Uh, and then you would check your motherboard manual or, or just the board itself, it's not really printed. Yeah, so the switch lets you switch between those, those two different mm. uh, pinouts. And then you have CMOS clear, power reset. And this one was a little bit different. So it's a talent that we started working with from the community called, mm. his nickname is Shaggy SVK. Okay. Um, so uh, he had a, like a, on his own time made, oh, this is, you know, what I think would be a good LN2 container. And he submitted the sign files. I'm like, yeah, this looks great. Mm. And then we did some small tweaks to it to make it more manufacturable. Yeah. And so we can hit uh, we wanted to hit the very accessible price point with this, so we made it kind of cost efficient. Um, and I think now it's it's two hundred fifty dollars for this. Okay, yeah, yeah, not, not um, bad for Alan Two containers. And um, yeah, this is so quite, quite a this is insane. Machining. <clears throat> this thing looks like the Death Star or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like crazy. So it's actually not using that much material. The machining time though is quite a bit. So yeah, mm -hmm. do you get it? Does this go through a CNC? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Functionally, what sort of benefit do you get from this design versus mm, some previous so designs? This, so I would say this is probably not the most high performance mm -hmm. container out there, but it's going to be half the price of like a similar performance I think container. the last one I bought was like 450 bucks yep. or 500. Yep. Yeah. But it has a lot of surface area, so it's, it's really uh, fast to cool down. Mm -hmm. It's also relatively low in mass. Like 1.6 yeah. kilos. Yeah. Right. Is this uh, <laughs> different? Right. So uh, this is a follow-up project. We needed a container for Sapphire Rapids, and this wasn't quite going to cut it. Yeah. yeah sure. Um, maybe only covers like half of the IHS. Yeah. <laughs> Sapphire Rapids is huge. Right. More of an all-out design. Huge. Uh, it's a bit corroded, but uh, um, wow. That's the machining of it. Yeah. Oh man. Can I see sure. The sure. Oh my God. We do have a... Do you know the weight of these uh, off the top of your head? We can check. <laughs> it's just like... It's going to tell you basically only, is it more or less than three kilos? Right. Oh, okay. All right. 2.5. It's in kilos? Yep. So 2.5 kilograms? Well, we can kilograms. change it if you, if you want. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you still use mounting hardware on this or do you just set it on top? Uh, we do, yeah. Okay. So I, I can show you maybe the so retail one. So this, this is a prototype, right? And then you can see here what the final product looks like. You get a bit of uh, sandpaper for okay. lapping it. Cool. Mounting hardware inside here. You ship here. with a different grit? Grits yeah. are all one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just a complete lapping kit? So I think it's kit. 600 and 1,000. Mm. Yeah. Cool. I see the mounting <laughs> hardware. Uh, some big springs and these. Oh yeah, three rods. Yep. Yeah. And then here is the wow, that final looks one. nice. That looks really nice. And we also actually sandblasted the. You only made ten of these, the you inside. said. Yeah, we might make ten more. Okay. <laughs> wow. Is this what you're going to be using uh, at G Skill this yep. week? Okay. Yep. Cool. Sweet. Uh, this Wednesday, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to check it out. Yeah, actually this one's quite expensive because we didn't do that many. Mm. This is a solid piece of uh, aluminum. Yeah. Uh, that's then, uh, I think it's sandblasted, anodized, and then laser uh, wow. etched. Is it uh, text laser? Yeah. yeah. Wow, okay, yeah. I don't know, when, this video will probably go up after Computex or something. We're gonna cut down a lot, so 
Um, we should have a separate thing showing this. It looks kind of volcano-esque, so I'm looking <laughs> forward to checking it out. But yeah. thank you, both of you guys, for joining. Yep, thank you for coming. With us. And we'll see you all in the next one.